the big question is how we're going to emerge from this. And what I'm going to do is to start out by talking about the Stability and Growth Pact, and then I'll talk about the reforms that are proposed, and then I'll come up with an alternative way of getting out. It concerned since the start of this Euro zone has been how do we control government spending? This is the, the big problem. Why can't we make sure some countries don't go off and start borrowing a lot and causing problems? The basic elements are a 100% deficit and a 60% debt to GDP ratio limit. And the question is how, did, how well does it work? Well, originally, the notion was that we needed to have convergent criteria so that you could join the Eurozone. So, in addition to those two pillars, the 3% and the 60%, there were restrictions on inflation rates, there were restrictions on exchange rates, and on long-term interest rates. But I'll focus on the government finance ones. By and large, the other three were satisfied fairly well by most of the entrants. <coughs> Now, if we go three years bit prior to entry to the Eurozone, we can see the government surplus or deficit for the different countries, the EU-12. I'll focus on uh, the EU-12. And what you can see is that the blue line is 96, the red line is 97, and the green line is 98. So a lot of countries had bigger deficits, so Italy, for example, Greece, and so on, by and large, they were moving significantly towards the 3%. Not all of them satisfied it by that time exactly, but they were making progress, at least. And one of the big fudges was that as we got closer, and it became clear that many countries wouldn't satisfy these criteria, the notion was a relaxation, as long as you were moving in that direction, it would be okay. Here's the gross government debt to GDP. And again, you can see that many countries were not satisfying that, and they were significantly outside, much worse than the deficit. So Italy, obviously, but also Belgium. And these countries didn't make that much. <coughs> Greece also didn't satisfy it, not as much as, as Italy and, uh, and Belgium. And of course, Greece joined two years later, eventually. So there were countries outside. But the notion was, as long as you're moving towards the targets, then it's OK. There were processes for dealing with violations of this. This is the preventive arm process the Commission would, would come up with monitoring and then proposals, and then it would go to the Council, the ECOFIN, and then there would be a decision. And then there were corrective arm processes, <coughs> ways of enforcing these, such as fines and so on. Question is, did it work? And the answer is, well, in 2002, Germany was heading towards a deficit which was bigger than 3%. So the Commission was alarmed, and Germany did a deal with the Commission not to put in process an EDP that they would start doing reforms. Now then France violated the 3%, and they got subjected to this excessive deficit process. And in November 2003, the Commission presented this evidence to ECOFIN, and pointed out that Germany and France had not taken adequate steps to reduce excessive deficits. Now, what then happened was that since ECOFIN is a political process with ministers, finance and economics ministers, they then started saying, no, don't vote these penalties on us. And so they didn't. There was no sanctions. And in fact, what they did was they suspended the Stability and Growth Pact in December 2004. And there was no country was penalized. So then they did the reform, they loosened the escape clauses, they lengthened the deadlines for the transitions, 
and they expanded the circumstances and allowed longer adjustment periods. Now, if we look at what was, was going on in, in the different countries, what we can see is that the convergent criteria worked. That in the sense that as you go up to 1999, by and large, countries did reduce their deficits. In the amount they did that varied. Here we've got the, the, the countries that did well, Ireland, Luxembourg, and Finland, and they went to surpluses. Here are some of the other countries which also reduced their deficits and, and went below. But what you can see is that most countries after the euro started, started to increase their deficits. And these are the countries, the problematic ones, Greece, France, Italy, Portugal, in terms of the deficits. And you can see many of them way outside the 3% criteria. So in fact, all countries except for Luxembourg and Ireland violated the 3% deficit rule at some point in that period. We can do the same thing with the debt to GDP ratios. Many countries increased, as we heard earlier this morning, particularly Greece. Again, no countries were penalized for any of these violations. There are a number of studies that looked at a comparison of OECD countries with Eurozone countries and looking at what happened to their uh, fiscal positions. And what they find is that, in fact, it seems the stability and growth <coughs> had no marginal effect. It didn't improve things, at least after the Euro was in existence. Now, once the crisis started, of course, this was a, a very unusual circumstance. And so, basically, countries violated the rules, both for the 3% deficit and the 60% GDP rule. And in fact, at the moment, there are only four <coughs> EU countries which satisfy the suitability and growth pact criteria. They're Denmark, and technically Denmark doesn't because it's still subject to an excessive deficit procedure. And we've got Estonia and Luxembourg, which are among the smallest countries in the, in the uh, Euro zone. Then Finland and then Sweden, of course, Sweden doesn't belong. Again, no countries have been penalized. Now, talk a little bit about market discipline. What we can see, as we've seen before, these rates were vastly different. They converged in 1999 when the euro started. And then we had the period through the 2000s when basically they moved as one with very low spreads. One of the interesting things here is that markets did not pick up that default was a possibility. And of course, up until a few weeks ago, many people who believed in efficient markets claimed that, in fact, there wasn't going to be a default, and so that this, they had indeed worked. But we now know that Greece did default, and in fact, the markets didn't pick up that possibility ahead of time. Now, since then, of course, we've had these big divergences, and markets are very worried about this possibility. The claim is that Greece is a one-off, but I think what it's actually done is to provide a model of how defaults within the Eurozone can occur. So now the question is, well, going forward, what are we going to do to try and enforce fiscal discipline on countries? And this is the 2012 reform, the Fiscal Compact Treaty. It's known as the Six Pack. One of the things that interests me is how many Europeans actually know what a Six Pack is. <laughs> so it's the usual kinds of things, fiscal policy, uh, we're going to have um, limits on that, we're going to have different uh, surveillance and so on, but basically it's more of the same. And they have revised the sanctions and penalties. So now we have reverse qualified majority voting. So you actually have to vote to stop the commission doing any sanctions. We have fines and the usual kinds of things. But the problem is, it's political still. And as soon as we get into this problem of countries being actually fined, 
then usually it hasn't worked. In fact, as we've seen, no country has ever been fine. Now this is what we're pinning the hopes on at the moment. This is the policy that's in place for solving the problem. The question is, will it work? Well, it hasn't worked in the past, and probably we need something else. Now, one of the things that we haven't talked too much about, except in Paul Krugman's talk yesterday, is the human cost of this crisis in the Eurozone. So we think about Greece, they've got a, about 20% unemployment rate, they've got youth unemployment approaching 50%. Their GDP is down 15%. The forecast this year is for another three to five percent, so they'll be 20 percent down. We don't know exactly how many years that will go on, but so far the official projections have done a poor job of predicting how bad things get. In Spain, as we heard yesterday, the unemployment situation is even worse. The IMF predicts that we won't get back to 2008 levels, until about 2017 in terms of GDP and in terms of unemployment that will take till 2022 or 23. So what are the alternatives? Well, the, the basic problem is that the shocks were much, much bigger than anticipated. And if you had shocks like we had in the Great Moderation, then the system would work okay. But we had much, much bigger shocks. The booms and busts, particularly in Spain and in Ireland, were enormous. And the problem is that the austerity measures don't seem to be working. Again, the official predictions were that they wouldn't much affect growth, and the markets were clear and things would work. But that's not what we see. What we see is dramatic effects on uh, unemployment and so forth, and then you have to have more, and GDP, and you have to have more cuts, and so on. Now, you could have transfers between countries, but the problem is that's not politically possible in Europe at the moment, because these would need to be fairly large transfers. So what are the alternatives? Well, I would suggest two, and these are ones that are, according to the official sector, completely unacceptable. So we had sovereign default within the Eurozone. That was the first one that was you know, going to be catastrophic. As Jean-Pierre was saying earlier, but what, what a mistake it was. I think what we saw was that by the time it, people had anticipated it, and it was in the system, it actually went ahead very smoothly. We didn't see the problems because the official sector did a very good job in terms of preparing to people expectations and making sure the banking system would be okay and that process is still working out but we haven't seen uh, huge problems resulting from uh, the, uh, the PSI. Now the other one which I, I agree with Paul Krugman again I think Greece will be the Eurozone if they're in such desperate position that it makes sense for them to do that. Now one of the things is it, is this a huge violation of everything in terms of being European and all those kinds of things? And I would say the problem with the, with the Eurozone, it, it tried to do things too early. We don't have the solidarity that it requires to have a joint fiscal policy and all of those things that we need. Now, these things, I think, will take maybe 20 to 30 years. If you look at the Bologna Agreement, what we see is a lot of intermixing of education in Europe and a lot more development young, among younger people in terms of thinking of themselves as Europeans <coughs> rather than as being from their own particular country. <coughs> so during that time, until we can get where it's politically acceptable to have these, <coughs> what I think we need to deal with these very large shocks is a temporary exit from the Eurozone. And this wouldn't be permanent. It would be a few years to get your economy back in order. And then you go back into the process of re-entering the Eurozone when you satisfy the, the uh, criteria. And 
these changes would provide a lot of incentives for the market to monitor things and to enforce discipline through spreads and so on. And that would be the alternative to having this political system, which, as I said, hasn't worked very well. We've talked about the Greek default. Argentina, so what happened in Argentina? How good or bad was it? It was clearly extremely chaotic and was problematic. The blue line is GDP in real terms. And you can see that from the peak of prior to the crisis, it went down about 20%. So Greece is going to be about that level. Now, the different thing with Argentina is that it started growing very quickly. They had a bad time for a, a year and a half or so, but then it started growing. And by now, and remember, we're still only a decade away. So this is the same kind of time zone that they're talking about Spain getting back to unemployment that they were in before the crisis and GDP and so on. They're already up 60%. So it's been a remarkable <coughs> recovery. Now, you may say, well, but don't they fix the inflation numbers in Argentina? And my understanding is, yes, they do. So in case you're worried about those numbers, Here's one in, if, you, if you measure GDP in, in dollar terms. It's roughly the same kind of story. So Argentina was successful. There are many other success stories. Uh, if you go back to the 90s with Finland and Sweden, they also had big exchange rate adjustments and then started growing. People say, well, Argentina, these countries are different because they were in a growing, a growing global and let me just give you an example where that wasn't the case, which is Korea in the recent crisis. Korea had a big exchange rate adjustment, and that helped it to grow. And it was one of the very few countries in quarter one 2009 which actually grew. It didn't grow by much. It was by 0.1% of GDP. But it has an economy that looks a lot like Germany and Japan, which were dropping 2-3% GDP in that quarter. The exchange rate adjustment allowed Korea to avoid that. It allowed the companies to become increasingly competitive. And Korea has done very well. There's a very nice paper by Barry Eichengreen and Jeffrey Sachs from 1985 in the Journal of Economic History. They go back and argue that in the Great Depression in the 1930s, the countries that came off the gold standard actually did pretty well. And un against conventional wisdom, it didn't damage the countries around them that much. So let me conclude my time's up. I think that the current policies in terms of austerity are not working. They are causing great suffering in these economies, and they're likely to continue to do that for many years to come. There is an alternative, and default is one, more radically even than that, is to have temporary exit, so that we can get this adjustment, which as Paul Krugman <coughs> pointed out yesterday, is extremely difficult to do by internal adjustments. I'll stop.